Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to Compass 101. Thank you for joining us. My name is Matt Stahl, I'm the Executive Director of Compass. With me today, I have several members of our staff. You'll hear from each of them during the course of today's program. To ensure sound quality, please mute yourselves. You can enter your questions in the chat box at any time. We will pause for questions throughout today's presentation. At those times, we will respond to questions in the chat box first, then offer the opportunity for you to unmute yourself and ask questions directly. We'll start with an overview of Compass, who and what Compass is and how we operate. We'll share with you some of the benefits of Compass membership, then provide a brief introduction into MPOs or Metropolitan Planning Organizations. Compass serves as the MPO for Ada and Canyon Counties. <clears throat> I will then touch briefly on transportation funding and related issues, then turn you over to our staff to share Compass's four primary role, regional roles, including a deep dive into our demographics program and trends. But first, a question, kind of an icebreaker. How many of you would like to live in a healthy and economically vibrant region? If so, use the reactions function in Zoom at the bottom of your screen to give a thumbs up. Well, it's looking like most of us are on the same page. Some of you aren't wanting to play, but thanks. Compass's vision is to be the forum for regional collaboration in Southwest Idaho that helps maintain a healthy and economically vibrant region, offering choices in how and where we live, they live, work, play, and travel. To do that, our mission is to conduct regional planning, facilitate coordination and cooperation, serve as a source of information and expertise on issues affecting Southwest Idaho, and assist member agencies in accessing funding to accomplish local and regional goals. Specifically, Compass accomplishes that through four main regional roles. We plan, mainly transportation planning. We implement those plans. We provide technical expertise and data, and we facilitate regional cooperation and collaboration among our members and Treasure Valley residents. Our staff will share more about each of these with you shortly. But first, I'll give you an overview of the organization, who we are and how we function. Compass is an association of governments that plans the future of Ada and Canyon counties. Those governments are mainly jurisdictions, the cities in Ada and Canyon counties, the two counties themselves, and three of the five highway districts in the two counties. Other government agencies with an interest in the future of Ada and Canyon counties are also members, Boise State University, Capital City Development Corporation, the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality, the Idaho Transportation Department, and Valley Regional Transit. The Governor's Office, the Greater Boise Auditorium District, and jointly Central and Southwest District Health are ex officio members. They have a seat at the table, but not a vote. If you take nothing else away from today, remember this, Compass is its members. While our staff conducts the day-to-day -day work and represents Compass, we are implementing and representing the direction of our members. That then raises the question, how we are formed. Compass is formed under a joint powers agreement. This is a type of agreement authorized under Idaho code that allows government agencies to share powers or responsibilities to perform functions that are in the best interest of all the agencies in the agreement. Compass's Joint Powers Agreement allows Compass to conduct and coordinate planning services, activities, and functions related to planning and regulatory responsibilities in nine different areas. The nine areas listed in the Joint Powers Agreement are shown on this and the next slide with our current primary responsibilities in bold. Those areas are air and water quality, economic development, emergency management, land use mapping and geographic information systems, population and employment, public services, facilities and utilities, recreation, parks and open space, transportation, 
where most of our work is focused, and such other purposes and authority as are consistent with the conduct of planning services for members, essentially other duties as assigned. Through our joint powers agreement, we provide that sweet spot where land use agencies such as cities and counties, transport, state transportation agency, the Idaho Transportation Department, and local transportation agencies such as highway districts and Valley Regional Transit come together to work for the good of the region. <clears throat> our board of directors represents the member agencies that have come together through our joint powers agreement. It is comprised primarily of local elected officials, mayors, city council members, and county and highway district commissioners. Everyone who lives in the two counties has multiple people representing them on the board. It is those board members who are compass. They provide the policy direction for the future of Ada and Canyon counties. That is then implemented by compass staff. The board consists of 30, 39 voting members and four ex officio or non-voting members. It meets every other month to address policy issues, including adopting and amending the long range transportation plan, the decisions and policies that feed into it, the regional transportation improvement program, Compass's budget, federal and state policy positions and various governance documents. We'll touch on most of these today. Compass works with committees to provide policy and technical recommendations to the Compass Board. The policy committees, the executive and finance committees, are subsets of the board itself. The technical committee, the Regional Transportation Advisory Committee, is made of member agency staff. Its composition mirrors that of the board. <clears throat> Our work groups provide issue-specific input and recommendations. Work groups operate under yearly charters and come and go as needs change. Unlike the board and the Regional Transportation Advisory Committee, membership on work groups is not limited to member agencies. Work groups are comprised of whatever type of expertise is needed to address a topic. Some of the topics addressed by our work groups include environmental issues, active and public transportation, freight, public participation, and more. Our staff of 23 employees is responsible for, the, for implementing the board's direction. We have two directors, myself and director of operations, Meg Larson. As a planning organization, most of our staff are planners divided into three teams, planning, resource development, and technical services. You'll learn more about each of these teams through the team leads in a few minutes. We also have one full-time and one part-time communication staff as well as two financial staff, one executive assistant, and three staff who work exclusively for the Ada County Air Quality Board. I'll pause briefly here to mention the Air Quality Board. Compass provides staffing and administrative support for the Air Quality Board. However, that board is completely separate, a completely separate governing body with its own joint powers agreement, board of directors, and budget. While there is some overlap in board members, the boards are completely separate. Neither board has purview over the other. Many of you are affiliated with Compass member agencies, cities, counties, highway districts, and other govern government agencies in Ada and Canyon counties. For members, Compass provides a variety of services at no charge, including various modeling and analytical services, such as analyzing the economic benefits of proposed projects, travel demand modeling, and analyzing the fiscal impact of different types of growth. Detailed traffic volume and congestion data and analyses, mapping and geographic information systems, or GIS, and orthophotography, as well as keypad polling, bicycle and pedestrian counts, meeting facilitation, grant writing assistance, and demographic data estimates and forecasts. Our demographer, Carl Miller, will take you on a deep dive into Compass's demographic work and regional demographic trends later in this meeting. As I mentioned earlier, everyone who lives in Aiden Canyon counties is represented on the Compass board by multiple board members. Having that seat at the table, a voice and a vote, 
ensures that your jurisdiction is a part of the process to plan for the future. The coordination through Compass and the decisions made by the Compass Board impact the quality of life of Treasure Valley residents today and tomorrow. In addition, Compass represents the region's needs and priorities at both the state and federal level. The board establishes legislative position statements annually and actively engages with the Idaho State Legislature and Idaho's congressional delegation to ensure regional needs are heard. Those legislative positions are on the Compass website and are one of several items that you will receive direct links to in a follow-up email after this workshop. We are also a member of several national organizations, the National Association of Regional Councils with the unfortunate acronym of NARC, the Coalition for America's Gateways and Trade Corridor, Gate, America's Gateways and Trade Corridors, CAGIT, and the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, or AMPO. By belonging to these, we lend our voice to advocate for national issues that affect regions such as ours. Additionally, we often have compass representation on leadership boards of these organizations, giving us an even stronger voice nationally. And finally, you've heard, you have the benefit of belonging to the region's MPO or Metropolitan Planning Organization. This gives your agency access to federal transportation funding, as well as assistance with federal funding applications and regulations. With that said, what is an MPO? An MPO, or Metropolitan Planning Organization, is a regional organization that is responsible for transportation planning and distributing federal transportation funds in urbanized areas with populations over 50,000. While the work conducted by MPOs is vitally important to ensuring cohesive planning for growth, it is also required for a region with, of over 50,000 to receive federal transportation funding. There are over 400 MPOs in the United States, and each is unique. There's not one prescribed way for them to be formed or exist. However, there are some basic requirements. An MPO must be established for an urbanized area with a population of at least 50,000, as recorded by the decennial census. So every 10 years, new MPOs are formed as new areas cross that threshold. The agencies that are members of the MPO must represent at least 75% of the area's population and the largest city must be a member. MPOs are developed through an agreement by local units of government and designated by the governor. While I call these requirements, that isn't entirely true. An urbanized area could choose to not form an MPO, but that would mean that the area had to forego federal transportation funding, which would be detrimental to that region. As I mentioned, there are over 400 MPOs in the US. Five of those are in Idaho, the Kootenai Metropolitan Planning Organization in Coeur d'Alene, the Lewis Clark Valley Metropolitan Planning Organization in Lewiston. That, that MPO serves Lewiston, Idaho and Clarkston, Washington together as they are one urbanized area. The Bannock Transportation Planning Organization in Pocatello, the Bonneville Metropolitan Planning Organization in Idaho Falls, and Compass serving both the Boise and Nampa urbanized areas. While they are served by one MPO, the Boise and Nampa urbanized areas are officially separate areas with separate requirements. So while Idaho has five MPOs, they serve six urbanized areas. <clears throat> The Nampa urbanized area encompasses Nampa, Caldwell, Middleton, and the area surrounding the three cities. It is one of five small urbanized areas in the state, and as such, shares federal funding with the other small urbanized areas, Coeur d'Alene, Pocatello, et cetera, as well as with urban areas in Idaho between, with populations between 5,000 and 50,000. The Boise urbanized area includes the cities of Boise, Eagle, Garden City, and Meridian, and the surrounding areas. Because its population is over 200,000, it is a transportation management area. 
which means it receives its own dedicated federal funding, but it also must comply with additional requirements. Compass's planning area encompasses all of Ada and Canyon counties, including both urbanized areas as well as portions of the counties outside of the urbanized areas. Before we move on, I want to touch on a few things that will be changing related to these areas. While some data from the 2020 census have been released, we are still waiting on the final data and methodologies that will be used to update how urban and rural areas are classified. That said, it is anticipated that the 2020 census will show that the Twin Falls area will meet the urbanized area criteria and need in this need to establish an MPO. However, that's not official yet. In addition, the new infrastructure law, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or bill, changes how population-based funding will be allocated, which will impact the amount of federal funding the region receives and how funding is divided among different areas. None of these changes have taken effect yet, and we are still waiting to learn exactly what the impacts will be. I anticipate we'll learn a lot over the next several months, and we'll share that with our members as we learn more. I'll also discuss about how uh, more about the bill as it relates to federal funding in a few minutes, and Carl Miller will provide a brief recap of the 2020 census. One, one of an MPO's primary responsibilities is to develop a long-range transportation plan for its planning area. Lisa Itkonen from our staff will discuss that with you in just a moment. But first, I wanted to highlight one of the most important issues we are dealing with, a significant funding shortfall. Through the long-range planning process, we have identified a $291 million per year transportation funding shortfall for the two county area. This includes public transportation, roadways, main, roadways, maintenance for both public transportation and roadways, safety projects, bicycle and pedestrian projects, and more. Without sufficient funding, the region falls further behind each year. Funding has simply not kept pace with growth and inflation. Most transportation funding comes from state and federal fuel taxes tying the funding to those who are using the roads. The federal fuel tax has not been increased since 1993. Imagine if you were trying to pay your mortgage, rent, or even buy groceries based on a 1993 salary. It would be nearly impossible. The state fuel tax was increased in 2015, but before that, had not been, it had not been increased since 1996. Fuel taxes are a flat are a flat rate per gallon, um, are flat rates per gallon, not percentages. So they don't change, reflect changes in the economy or gas prices, which means their buying power has decreased significantly compared to the cost of construction. In addition, because they are based on the amount of fuel purchased, they're generating less and less funding compared to the number of miles driven because cars are getting better and better gas mileage or not purchasing fuel at all in the case of electric vehicles. <clears throat> While these advances are good for the environment and our dependence on fossil fuels, the method of funding transportation has not ad adapted. We're using an outdated paradigm based on the amount of fuel purchased to fund improvements and maintenance. So what do we do? Both the state and federal governments have found ways to shore up eroding transportation funding, but none provide a long-term user-based solution. At the federal level, since 2008, Congress has transferred $272 billion of general fund money into the Highway Trust Fund to pay for transportation. While this has kept the Federal Highway Trust Fund from going broke or insolvent, it is not a sustainable long-term solution. At the state level, Idaho has used bonding to fund some large infrastructure projects and also recently began using sales tax revenue to help fund transportation. In 2017, 
1% of the sales tax was initially directed towards transportation. In 2021, this was increased to 4.5% of the with the first $80 million per year to be used for bonding for large projects on state highways. Anything over $80 million is to be distributed to local transportation agencies. This additional funding is providing a much needed shot in the arm for large projects, but on its own does not provide the solution. We are still left with a backlog of maintenance needs and the sales tax based funding is not guaranteed to always be dedicated to transportation as the fuel tax is. Governor Little is recommending an additional $200 million in ongoing funding to address maintenance needs and another $200 million in one-time funding to help address deficient bridges. I hope the legislature will follow the governor's lead in dedicating funding to support a safe and efficient transportation system. In addition to the governor's proposal, many options exist that could solve or at least help alleviate the statewide and regional transportation funding shortfalls. One option is to simply change the fuel tax from a per gallon tax to a percent tax as sales tax is calculated. Another is to index fuel taxes to inflation. These both would help help fuel taxes automatically keep pace with economic changes without requiring legislative bodies to periodically approve new or increased taxes. However, with both of those changes, however, both of the, while both of those changes would help keep up with inflation, they do not account for decreasing revenue due to more fuel efficient vehicles. Additionally, in the long term, fuel taxes are being pushed to fewer and fewer individuals as the number of electric vehicles continues to rise. A vehicle mile traveled tax would address all those issues. It levels the playing field by charging people based on how far they drive instead of by how much they how much fuel they buy. Everyone pays the same amount per mile instead of skewing the burden of fuel taxes towards those who drive less fuel efficient vehicles. With a vehicle mile traveled tax, I often hear the concern over being tracked by Big Brother. Keep in mind that there are different ways of tracking mileage, including old school, where mileage is simply taken from the odometer with no record of where those miles were driven. That could be an option for those who want to maintain their privacy. While more sophisticated means of measuring mileage can involve tracking where you're going. If you own a smartphone, keep in mind that that information is already being tracked through your phone. Another tool that could help is a local option sales tax. With this type of tax, residents vote on whether or not they to tax themselves for specific projects. It is typically used on a project by project basis, so it wouldn't be the solution for the entire funding shortfall, but it could be one part of a multi-pronged effort. In addition, a local option has the benefit of being local. Just as the name says, Idaho is a diverse state. We know that those the needs in the panhandle aren't identical to those in the Treasure Valley. With a local option tax, different areas could focus on their own highest priority issues or choose not to use it at all. By definition, local option is not a one size fits all approach. However, in Idaho, other than small resort communities, jurisdictions don't have the authority to pursue this option. We we would like the legislature to grant that. So at least it's on the table. Changing gears slightly, as I mentioned, a few few minutes ago, Congress passed, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, Congress passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as Bill, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law in November. The bill includes over one point two trillion dollars in spending across all types of infrastructure from wastewater to broadband to of course transportation in fact transportation alone will receive over 567 billion dollars nationally over five years we are still digesting the contents of the new law 
and waiting for official guidance and funding tables from the US Department of Transportation. But I'll share a few things we do know. First, we will see an increase in transportation funding in existing programs. It is estimated there will be, there will be a roughly 33% increase in current funding programs flowing to the states. That will include a significant increase in, trans, in transportation alternative funds, which are funds for bicycle and pedestrian and other non-roadway transportation projects. Second, there are two new formula funding programs, a carbon reduction program to reduce transportation emissions and the PROTECT program, promoting resilience operations for transformative, efficient and cost-saving transportation to increase resilience. Third, there are multiple new competitive grant programs. And finally, in addition to funding, there are a host of policy changes, such as an increased folks focus on the nexus between transportation and housing affordability. As we get more guidance, we will continue to share what we learn about the local and regional impacts of bill, the bill with our members. With that brief overview of who Compass is, our members, and what we do, coordinate regional cooperation and collaboration, particularly for transportation planning and funding. I'll open the floor to any questions you have before turning you over to our staff to discuss each of our regional roles in more detail. Amy will moderate the questions from the chat first, then we will open the floor to any questions you want to ask orally. Amy? Thank you, Matt. We have not had any questions entered into the chat to this point. Um, I will open the floor if anyone would like to unmute themselves to ask a question orally. I am watching the screen to see if I can see any microphones unmuting. That said, if I do miss you, um, definitely speak up. But Matt, I am not seeing anyone coming off of mute at this point. So if you have questions later that pop into your head for Matt, definitely enter them into the chat and we will address them uh, after Lisa or after our next speaker after that. So do be thinking of your questions and enter any questions that you have into the chat as we work along. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, I, can you verify this is the right screen? Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my name is Lisa Aitgren. I'm a principal planner and the planning team lead, and I am working with four other planners in the team. And as Matt talked about um, those four regional roles that uh, we have, I will talk more about the planning that we do. And as Matt mentioned, the key planning product of a metropolitan planning organization is that regional long-range transportation plan. And it is a plan that looks out at least 20 years into the future. And it plans for a multimodal transportation system that meets the needs of the forecasted growth. Multimodal here means that it includes roadways, transit, active transportation or walking and biking, and also freight. And we also then do a financial forecast uh, for this plan so that we know what we can reasonably expect to be able to pay by that horizon year, because we can only show those projects as funded in the plan that actually have money to pay for them. So, and of course, then in addition to all of that, um, the public and agency involvement and feedback throughout the planning process are really important. Um, and I'll touch uh, a little bit more on the surveys that we've done for the um, plan update that we're working on now. And then at the end of this process, we also conduct an air quality conformity demonstration for projects in Northern Ada County, because that is still an air quality maintenance area. And we need to ensure that the planned roadway projects won't cause the air quality to get worse. And we update the plan every four years. The current plan is called Community Motion 2042.0. And it is a completely online plan. So you can get to that from the Compass website and um, learn a whole lot more about it. Um, this is a very pared down summary of the plan. Um, so it plans for a forecasted 2040 population of just over a million people uh, in Aden Canyon counties. And it addresses the components of the complete uh, transportation system. 
We forecasted available funding and the plan describes how that money is allocated. This plan focuses federal funding on maintenance. And as Matt mentioned, we have a funding shortfall to meet the identified and prioritized needs. The funded transportation improvements in the plan include maintenance, um, as well as then public transportation projects, bridge rehabilitation and replacements, safety projects, intelligent transportation system projects, such as you know, uh, signals and those kinds of things, uh, bicycle and pedestrian projects, studies, planning, special projects, travel demand management, and also roadway expansion, which you see on the background there in blue, um, that's the, the map of those. And um, I mentioned that we have unfunded needs, and those include uh, state roadway system priorities, local roadway system priorities, which most of them include bicycle and pedestrian facilities, um, public transportation priorities, and deferred maintenance. This is a screenshot um, of the interactive map um, that we have um, of the Community Motion 2042.0 projects, both funded and unfunded. Um, and you can find this from the Compass website and take a closer look from there. So this is the, the out funding outlook of the current plan. So even with $6.7 billion in funding, we still have a significant unfunded um, need, $5.5 billion um, that's unfunded, uh, which translates to that $291 million per year that uh, Matt mentioned, or it's about a dollar per day per person in the two counties um, based on the 2021 population. And as I mentioned um, earlier, we update the plan every four years, and we are currently working on community motion 2050. Uh, we have a three-step process for developing this plan, and we are here now. Um, at the beginning of the plan update, we established that demographic forecast for that horizon year, and we then developed the vision for what that growth should look like. To develop the, commu uh, the Community Motion 2050 vision, we started with the population forecast of nearly 1.1 million people by 2050. Well, it's 1,075,000 to be exact. Um, and Carl Miller will talk a little bit more about the forecast in his presentation. To inform uh, the vision for that growth, we conducted a, a lot can change in 30 years public survey in the fall of 2019. And we re received over 3,700 participants in that survey who explored how the Valley will be different in 30 years uh, in terms of demographic, societal, or, <clears throat> or technological changes. And, and <clears throat> keep in mind, this was pre-COVID. Um, so what we learned was that uh, residents wanted a house on a large lot, alternative work arrangements. They wanted to spend uh, leisure time in nature. They really wanted to drive alone, but also would use rail if that was available. And people were concerned about the cost of housing and worried about growth. And so we took what we learned from that first survey and we turned those responses into four distinct growth and transportation scenarios that you see there on the right. Let it be. Ticket to Ride, Penny Lane, and Come Together. We asked about those four scenarios, uh, values, and also implementation strategies in the second survey um, that we conducted the summer of 2020. That was called, Where Do We Grow From Here? And we had over 3,100 participants in that one. In the survey results, um, the two best liked scenarios, when we translated the one to five scoring to a Likert scale, were ticket to ride and come together. So ticket to ride uh, was the scenario that had the rail. That was the only one of the four that, that featured a, a, a rail service. And also then it would provide a mix of housing, uh, including apartments near transit, and of course the single family homes, the rail stops, Will, would be located near new urban activity centers, helping preserve farmland, 
and we would most certainly need new local funding to pay for that increased transit. Come Together um, was really built on the premise of, you know, how can we grow in a way that would um, put least amount of impact, or, you know, financial impact on local governments. So this one um, would really direct the growth to where we already have infrastructure. Um, so we would, um, so this would really um, be easy on the community budgets and it would preserve farmland. Uh, transportation funding would be used to improve transit and this one would feature a bus system that would serve most of the valley. And it just so happens when you look at those percentages that they all ended up being <clears throat> kind of exactly the same for the two best liked and the two least liked scenarios. In that second survey, we also asked about those values. We asked people to rank the, the, these eight to their top five. And these eight were identified as important to the Treasure Valley from the last eight years of community motion outreach, Boise State survey, um, and also by our work groups and focus groups of stakeholders. In working with our Regional Transportation Advisory Committee and the Compass Board of Directors, we've translated these values into goals. And the overall goal statement is that through providing transportation of options and an effective transportation system, Communities in Motion 2050 will support growth management, affordability, economic vitality, outdoor lifestyle, environmental health, and choices in where people live. The four goal areas are safety, convenience, quality of life, and economic vitality. And there are 18 objectives that define these goals and tie them back to the survey results, previous goal areas, and federal requirements. So what we heard was this um, desire for a more robust public transportation system. And that was consistent in the first two surveys. In the first survey, um, almost half of the respondents said that they were very likely to ride high capacity transit or rail if it was available. And in the second survey, the two scenarios um, with the, the most robust public transportation system uh, scored the highest. So the ticket to ride and come together. But we still didn't know really, um, we didn't have the public feedback on what that transit system should look like. And since community motion is about the growth and transportation system that meets the future needs, and we heard very loud, <laughs> clearly that there was support um, and people wanted more and better transit, we conducted this third survey all aboard, specifically about transit needs and preferences. But first, I mentioned uh, high capacity transit. So what is that? Uh, broadly, it, it refers to transit that carries more people and is faster than a standard bus. So uh, it has service improvements, uh, such as increased frequency, separation from other traffic, um, uh, in addition to passenger amenities, such as you know, nicer bus stops, probably um, an off-board fare payment system, to things that would make it more um, reliable and faster, both boarding, alighting, and then on the way. And it could include light rail, light rail commuter rail, uh, or bus rapid transit, which is essentially a bus that functions like a train. Compass has been looking at high capacity transit for the region for many, many years. And the region has been planning for high capacity transit on State Street, north of the the Boise River for many years. And we've been studying high capacity transit options for south of the river. So in that third survey, <clears throat> we had um, over 11,000 responses. Um, and we used the survey res uh, results and the previous studies to identify a locally favored option or the best fit for alignment and mode from the options that we've been studying based on the analysis um, of the survey results. And in June of 2021, Compass Board uh, of Directors approved regional rail along on the Boise cutoff as the locally favored high capacity transit option south of the river. Um, 
and it means that it could be it could, it could use commuter rail technology and the the current track but would function more like a light rail with more stops and more frequent service so once we had the high capacity transit lines um, and uh, you know that we could then finalize the vision and the community motion 2050 vision or the preferred growth and transportation scenario allocates the growth to the year 2050 by mapping and forecasting uh, mapping the forecasted uh, locations of new population households employment activity centers and more across the two counties and essentially it shows what the region could look like by 20 uh, by, by 2050, based on the population forecast and public input from the three surveys, and also what's in the current local plans. Um, the, this was reviewed by local land use agencies to ensure that we are aligned in our efforts to develop this growth and transportation vision. So to summarize what I've talked about and what we've completed to date is we have that forecast of 1,075,000 people in the two counties by 2050. We've established goals to the, um, the new plan. We've identified the tra high capacity transit options south of the river. Uh, we have uh, the growth and transportation vision for 2050. And we also have a complete network policy to guide us in identifying transportation needs which is coming up. We are working currently on um, uh, identifying those needed transportation improvements and priorities. We will then uh, finalize the financial forecast and develop a funding plan. Also, we'll have implementation strategies for the plan, and then we will we'll have a draft plan for public comment later on this fall. And um, so that we can get that ready for, um, we can get the plan ready for adoption by the end of the year. So. As we are updating the plan and working with members and the public to get it ready for the board's adoption by December, we have a parallel track to implement the current plan. And Tony uh, Teasdale will uh, tell you more about that. So I will be happy to answer any questions that you have um, before turning you over to Tony to discuss the implementation. Um, and Amy will moderate questions from the chat first. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, as I ask this question, I'm going to ask that you flip your slides back to the vision map, because I think you're going to want that to kind of help answer your question. Um, and the question deals with the high capacity transit and why are we looking at State Street or along the river? Isn't the need from downtown Boise to the west part of the valley? The, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. So what we have identified is so the, the planning for state street has been going on for many many years and it's it's moving forward um and what then we identified now a locally favored option for the rail from caldwell to boise and again it is based on the studies that we've done we are nowhere near actually being able to start building anything um one, we need local funding for it. Um, and there's a process that we need to go through um, to get there. So we will be uh, proposing to move forward with planning for that um, to, to keep the momentum going. I'm not sure if I answered the question. I think to my understanding of the question to put a finer point is the both of those high capacity transit systems would start in downtown Boise or end in downtown Boise, depending on which way you're going. Um, one would then go from downtown Boise up along State Street towards the west. Mm -hmm. And the other, at least if you want to show on your screen and kind of trace with your cursor, would go from downtown Boise paralleling um, the existing rail corridor out to Caldwell. So there. both do from the downtown to the to the western part of the valley with the um, one for south of the river um, going further west and the other north of the river not going quite as far west. Correct. Okay, I got a, a chat, yeah, excuse me, a comment in the chat that yes, that was the question. Okay. And one thing to keep in mind is that for these for this kind of high capacity service to, to actually work, it needs a very robust bus system. 
to support it because obviously people still need to go somewhere from in most cases need to go somewhere from that station so you need that sort of a feeder system back and forth so that is part of the planning that we're that that is part of that system that as we are planning you now for 2050. Okay, that is the only question in the chat. Again, I will offer the opportunity if you would like to unmute yourself um, and ask any questions to Lisa directly. I'll watch to see if I see any microphones um, being unmuted. So this is Teresa Jorgensen. I'm a council member with Garden City. You mentioned that local funding will be needed. Is that uh, city funds or county funds, what type of funding are, are, will be needed? That is getting to what Matt was talking about, the local option um, taxing authority. Um, so some kind of local dedicated funding source um, for that. I don't know if Matt, you wanna elaborate. Sorry, trying to get all the buttons turned back on. Um, yes, council member. So uh, Idaho is one of two states that doesn't have a dedicated funding mechanism for public transportation. And why that's important is that the federal government, especially after you hit the size that we're at, expects you um, as a region to, to be able to um, operate and maintain the public transportation system with local dollars and not be dependent upon the federal dollars. Federal dollars are typically expected to be used for capital expenses or building the system. But then you're supposed to have um, some sort of methodology to um, fund the operation and maintenance of the system, whether that's from fare box recovery or something of that nature. Uh, typically, um, there's an additional source of revenue that's used um, within a state or a region to um, supplement those funds, uh, fare boxes. And then also um, you have to match the federal funds for the capital expenditures. And for a transit system, that match ranges anywhere from 20% to 50% of that federal grant. Um, and that's a rather significant amount of money when we're talking about um, a high capacity fixed rails type system. Um, so I said, we're one of two states, uh, when I started many years ago in this position, we used to be one of four states that did not have a dedicated funding mechanism. Those four states were Idaho, Mississippi, um, Hawaii, and Alaska. Um, over the past 20 some odd years, Alaska and Hawaii have gotten a dedicated funding mechanism for public transportation, thus they're, they built uh, their high capacity systems um, in their areas. Um, Idaho is still at the bottom of the list with Mississippi um, in this situation. Um, we're hopeful that um, we have some mechanism th that we can um, be able to match the federal funds. Um, some areas use property tax, uh, given I'm sure as you're aware, the dialogue that's going on at the legislature and uh, locally, I don't think there's that much appetite to um, increase property taxes to fund public transportation. Um, and that's where we see the most likely um, tool that's available that's been used in other states is a local option tax and authority. Uh, but to get that, we have to get authorizing language um, from the legislature. To date, uh, they have not been willing to grant that. Thank you, Matt. I don't see anyone else unmuting themselves with questions for Lisa. If you do have questions for Lisa or Matt um, at a later time, please do enter those in the chat and we will circle back with those as we finish up with Tony, who is your next speaker. With that, I will turn you over to Tony Tisdale. Thank you. Oh, I've got all of our pictures on there. Wow, oh, that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right. There we go. So is this a correct screen? Sometimes we have some technical. Yes, it is, Tony. So, all right. So um, let me, I, I think I just messed up. 
Okay, here we go. All right, so hi, I'm Tony Tisdale. I'm the team lead for the resource development team. We have a grant writer and a data analyst on the team, but unfortunately our grant writer position is currently vacant. So we are um, in interviews right now trying to fill that position. So hopefully we'll have somebody on board soon. The next step we're taking um, what we learned from developing the long range transportation plan and match those needs with funding. So Compass manages three federal programs and two local programs to help meet those needs. And we're constantly on the lookout for new funding sources. We are now at the implementation role of Compass, getting our needs funded, but there's just not enough money for all the transportation needs out there. Um, so we're currently focused on maintaining what we already have, trying to increase funding and securing additional funding sources, but also making the best use of the limited funds that we do have. And we do that through performance-based planning, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So we have been in a maintenance mode in the Treasure Valley for quite some time, but growth is catching up with us. Over the last decade, we have been adding some capacity or widening type projects to try to keep up with the tremendous growth, but maintenance was still our focus. We have new direction from the, the Compass Board, um, but that was just passed last fall. The new direction allows strategically addressing the goals and vision of communities in motion, but maintenance is still a large part of the overall goals. The resource development team works very hard to secure resources and find new resources through the resource development plan. Our goal is to bring as much funding through many sources into the Treasure Valley to fill those transportation needs. In the next few slides, I'll run through the process we use for the resource development program. We start with the member needs, agencies with transportation jurisdiction, determine what their needs are, and that would be based on the findings and communities in motion and submit an application. The application process is based on the needs. Federal funding is complicated, so staff determines funding eligibility after the application is submitted. Agencies focus on their projects, we focus on the funding sources. The resource development plan is developed and that includes all applications received plus a focus area for each member agency that are a little bit more general in nature. If we run across a funding source that could assist a member agency, we share the funding with them and offer to assist in writing a grant. The Compass Board of Directors approves the resource development plan annually, so they approve ahead of what Compass staff will be working on throughout the year. Projects that do not get funded stay on our unfunded list. Staff will continue to search for funding for those projects throughout the year through sharing resources, determining eligibility of a grant, help with writing a grant, reviewing or management assistance, as well as providing letters of support. An example of a project that Compass staff helped ITD staff with was a request submitted in the fall of 2017 for an infra grant. That's an infrastructure for rebuilding America. That's through the US Department of Transportation. This project widens Interstate 84 from Franklin Boulevard to Karcher Road in the city of Nampa with a total cost of $150 million. Our region received a grant for the full request amount of 90 million. You can imagine how important this type of grant is to our region. And you've probably also noticed the construction going on over there. ITD is getting really close to completing this project. So we'll continue to work with our members to apply for similar grants as they become available. And with the new transportation bill, we expect a lot of competitive grants opportunity over the next five to six years. Our locally managed federal and local programs fund the top ranked projects. One of our local programs is the Communities in Motion Implementation Grant Program. The Compass Board typically budgets about $50,000 per year to fund small member agency projects that directly implement Communities in Motion. These projects must be in a city center or an activity center and closely follow the goals of Communities in Motion. Some examples of recent CIM implementation grants are creating a plan for a mixed use parking lot in downtown CUNA, and adding guardrails in the city of Wilder along a canal near schools. The project development program is our other local program. This program takes a concept or project idea and using a consultant develops that idea into about 20 to 30% of design. That creates a well thought out need statement, cost estimate, and maybe even a phasing plan, a public involvement plan, and also an environmental scan. It takes that idea and makes it ready to compete for federal funding or other programs as well. 
An example is a project sponsored by the Canyon Highway District to develop safe access to Lake Lowell by bicyclists and pedestrians. A plan was developed and Canyon Highway District applied for and was recently awarded funding to construct wider shoulders through the federal lands access program. We call those flap funds. That allows wider, safer access for bicyclists and pedestrians around the lake. And the City of Eagle developed a plan for a grade separated bicycle and pedestrian crossing of State Highway 44, also known as State Street. And funding has not been obtained yet, but the city now has a concept which will provide a starting point for a good application in the future. We're actually currently in phase two of this project in, in the program for project development to further define if the crossing should be under or over the highway. We also fund the top ranked projects with federal aid programs. Many of you are aware of federal aid projects. Much of the federal funding for local projects has been focused on maintaining roadways and our public transportation system. An example is a maintenance project on Collister Drive um, on, by Quail Ridge Drive that goes through the, the end to the dead end of that road. That's in the city of Boise to preserve the pavement, improve sidewalks, and also including the accessibility ramps. There's also a project in Boise State University campus to make an unimproved section of sidewalk along the Greenbelt more like the other improved sections. This creates safer transportation for cars, bicyclists, and pedestrians on sections that are adjacent to a roadway. The needs identified in Communities in Motion 2042.0 directly impact the projects funded in the Regional Transportation Improvement Program known as the TIP. The TIP is a short range budget of federal funds. The program is five years plus preliminary development, which takes uh, the program to about seven years in length. It also includes any locally funded projects or developer driven projects that are considered regionally significant. So it doesn't necessarily include only federal projects. Any project in, this, in the TIP must be consistent with the long range transportation plan and it is updated annually, but there is flexibility to amend and modify as needs arise. When you look at the TIP project, project list, you'll notice there's a lot of information. Much of the detail is required by federal regulation, but we also include some additional information to make each project make more sense to you as you review it. Um, you'll notice here the title, um, sponsor, and key number, and many times we'll reference a project by the key number. It's much easier to find in the report once you know that number. Um, a map or graphic showing where these projects are, what kind of projects they are a funding source, and then the local match and phasing. And remember that these dollars are in thousands of dollars, so you do need to add three zeros to the end of all these costs. One of our most important tasks is ensuring that funds in the current year are obligated on time. Compass staff works very closely with member agency staff throughout the year to make sure that this happens. One of the more recent focused areas is performance measure reporting. We show performance measures within the TIP achievement section in the TIP reports. Um, this shows how projects implement Communities in Motion 2042.0 goals and also how projects meet the statewide targets that are federally required. At the beginning of the TIP document, there's a page called In a Nutshell, which provides a brief summary of the performance measures and where we stand. Most of the statewide targets are being met through the projects that are programmed, but some of our story is negative. We realize that the interstate is not meeting reliability targets in the Treasure Valley, However, our future projects that are already funded in the TIP should help make the system more reliable. We are behind in roadway maintenance and it's becoming more difficult to keep our transit routes operating even at the current levels, much less improving the servicing system. Hopefully the new transportation authorization bill will bring some of the additional funded that's needed to help that, that situation. We will continue to build the overall story of our system and that makes it able to um, help the public understand the complete story but also to help our leaders make better informed decisions. I'll open the floor to any questions or comments you have before turning the um, presentation over to Mary Ann to discuss the technical side of Compass. Amy will moderate the questions from the chat first. So, Thank you, Tony. Um, we don't have any more questions that have been posted in the chat, uh, but I will offer the opportunity if anyone would like to unmute themselves to ask any questions of Tony or of Lisa or Matt uh, directly at this point. Do you have any questions for Tony on funding? I am not seeing any microphones coming off of mute. So with that, I will turn you over to Marianne 
Again, if any questions pop in your head as Marianne is speaking, please feel free to add those to the chat and we'll address them uh, as Marianne finishes up. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thumbs up that I have the right display. Yes, you do. Great, thank you. Again, good morning. My name is Marianne Waldinger and I am the technical services team lead. We are a team of five with two of our team members uh, primarily focused on geographic information systems, mapping I'll chat a little bit about and then congestion management and then also on the technical tools such as, such as modeling. So one of the four regional roles Compass fills is providing that technical assistance and expertise, not only to our member agencies, but oftentimes even to the, to the public. So the technical team are responsible for data and analysis. Uh, data and analysis are made up of a variety of things, as you can imagine, you know, spatial analysis, analyzing travel time data, compiling and or collecting data for our needs, such as that, that traffic count database that, that you saw uh, and interactive map, along with building, maintaining and applying uh, many of our, our technical tools. So Compass has served as the mapping resource for several decades. Uh, transportation activities really do need the development of maps for analysis, review, public display, brainstorming, some of those sessions that when you look at a project, you know, what are some of the things going on in this area? Geographic information systems or, or GIS allows for that spatial analysis and um, the ability to especially analyze data to, to support many of our local planning efforts. We also have a regional data center or often referred to as an open data site. That's where publicly available information and data are provided in a structured, accessible, usable format, making just data sharing a lot more efficient. Orthophotography or aerial photography was completed back in April of 2019. The next one will occur this spring. The coordination going on with our member agencies makes these projects or these efforts very cost effective, high quality, but they're also the information or orthophotography uh, are also available for purchase by our private sector. In addition to uh, being a mapping resource, we're becoming a one-stop shop for a variety of data. So as mentioned, we use a variety of data uh, and becoming really a, a clearinghouse. Some of the examples of data that we can make more readily available is the census data, as Matt even mentioned, just, you know, that that's something that just occurred in 2020 and we use it for a lot of different things so we can make that more readily available to folks that are interested. Plus the region wide traffic count data, the, the traffic counts are actually taken and provided by our member agencies, but we stitch it all together and have an interactive map so people can go out and look at what some of the potential volumes are. One of our projects was looking at what happened in 2019 during uh, the, the height of COVID and then just how things have, have changed over years. So it's, it's pretty fascinating to see what's, what's going, out on, going on out on our system. We also collect uh, data for our own needs. We have uh, bike and pedestrian counters. We have permanent ones. We have 16 locations throughout the two county area. Recently, we completed a household travel survey where over 4,000 Treasure Valley residents were invited and participated in it. If you actually received a postcard and participated, I do wanna thank you for your time and effort on that. The, the survey and the data that we collect during these surveys provide what's necessary to build and maintain our technical tools as well as support a variety of our planning efforts and conduct additional analysis. As Matt mentioned, we became a TMA and with that we have some additional responsibilities and so we uh, work on the congestion management process. I'll talk a little bit about the data behind it and a little bit more about what that is. So. When we became that transportation management area, this congestion management process was that additional responsibility or added task. Annually, we produce a report of travel time on our, our system. We have an interactive online map right now. It uses travel time data that are provided for primary roads. I-84, Eagle Road, US 2026, Jenna Boulevard, State Highway 44, and a variety of other ones. Well, 
it appears that the coverage is limited, the data are much more comprehensive because it's 24 seven. This really helps us identify reoccurring and non reoccurring congestion. Some of you may have been stuck on the freeway a little bit yesterday. I was one of those one of those people with with a, a minor accident on on the interstate. But these data, because they are 24 seven and they're a lot more comprehensive, it's easier and more effective to actually answer the question of how are we doing? How is our system doing? We can look at, we can do that on an annual basis. We can say what's happened, what was going on in our system before a project, during a project or after a project. Tony mentioned one of the performance metrics showing that I-84 is not reliable but we have a couple projects that are one's complete and one's still underway. We'll be able to use this data to say, how are we doing? Have we gotten better? So these data in, is, supports those federal performance measures in the transportation improvement program, but also in um, the long range plan. So congestion management isn't just about concrete and asphalt. There are a lot of other strategies that are, can be considered and should be considered. So there's everything from those that are most noticeable, noticeable the, the construction projects, the asphalt and the concrete, but ones that are just as important, but maybe not as obvious, uh, like a recent park and ride study that, that was completed or signal timing, things of that nature that we don't really see, but we definitely know that benefits our system. The congestion management, uh, process lays out strategies for mitigating congestion and also um, helps us, again, just really tell that story in a much more comprehensive way. As mentioned, uh, data are used to build our technical tools. I'll briefly talk about three of them. So the regional travel demand model, it, it is really helps us kind of tell the story of if this happens, if we grow to over a million people, if we invest in this, if we invest in that, that's one of the, the best uses for the tra travel demand model. So we use the travel demand model to support the long range transportation plan that Lisa talked about, and also the transportation improvement program that Tony talked about. We support our transportation agencies, our highway districts, Idaho Transportation Department, Valley Regional Transit. We also uh, evaluate and analyze how um, the impacts of proposed developments to help inform transportation impact studies as they go forward and are developed for our member agencies to, to consider. So outputs from the model are also near, necessary for air quality conformity that only applies to Northern Ernie County. And it is an integral part of the transportation improvement program and the long range transportation plan. So what conformity does is it compares the transportation related motor vehicle emissions to air pollutant budgets. The air pollutant budgets are established in our state implementation plans. The purpose is to demonstrate that our investments will not cause the area to exceed those pollutant budgets. Another tool, benefit costs, Matt also mentioned about this. Uh, so these benefit cost analyses are required oftentimes as part of federal grants, but we use them for local process purposes as well. And they provide a data assisted decision. For example, Idaho Transportation Department has a safety and capacity program, and this is basically statewide competition for dollars. So Compass will perform the benefit cost analysis for uh, projects on the state system that are in our two county region and, and provide that information as the, as the list of projects go forward um, to the ITD management and further up for those decisions. So um, as mentioned, uh, you know, our team is responsible for data and analysis. It has a lot of different shapes and sizes and we work very closely with our communication staff to share our data in with the public in a way that is easily understood. And I'll stand for any questions before I turn it over to Amy. Great, thank you, Marianne. Um, one question I got in the chat asked about the um, TMA, the Transportation Management Area. Uh, Matt had mentioned that earlier and you alluded to it as well. Could you explain again what that is and, and what the, um, can the ramifications of that are? So the Transportation Management Area um, the, the designations occur when an area it hits 200,000 population or higher. And so with that, there are some additional responsibility for those areas in, in part of the planning process. So. Great, thank you. 
Um, that was the only question I received in the chat. I am looking to see if anyone um, has unmuted themselves. If you do have a question you would like to ask Marianne directly, um, now is the time I'm looking. I do not see any microphones unmuted. As with before, if you have any additional questions that you think of, um, definitely add those to the chat and we can direct those to Marianne um, after um, our next speaker, which is me. Um, so I've been talking to you today and so far um, up until now, I've been kind of a disembodied voice, um, but um, now I get a chance to visit with you. First, I will ask um, one of my colleagues to verify that you are seeing my correct screen. Yes, you guys. Yeah. Thank you. So I am Amy Left. I am the communication coordinator at Compass and the communication team lead. And I'm going to share with you today Compass's fourth and final role, and that is the role of regional facilitator. As Matt mentioned earlier, Compass is the forum for regional collaboration in Southwest Idaho. We are where the cities, the counties, the highway districts, the Idaho Transportation Department, Valley Regional Transit, and others come together to make decisions in the best interest of the region and its residents. We also ensure collaboration and cooperation with the residents themselves through our communication program. Our communication program is really very intertwined. Um, there are a lot of different aspects of it, but ultimately all work together to support regional collaboration. I'll share those different aspects with you now. Um, I also do wanna point out that our program works with our public participation work group. That's one of those many work groups that Matt mentioned earlier. That work group is comprised of communication staff from our member agencies, as well as members of the public uh, and a journalist, all to help us um, in our outreach and education efforts, provide us input and help us make sure that we are doing uh, the best we can to engage with all of the members of the public to ensure that all of those voices are heard as we are planning for the future. Our education and outreach programs are designed to share information about Compass's plans, studies, and projects, as well as delve into regional and national issues relating to transportation, to funding, to land use, growth, and more. As Mary Ann said, we work closely with our technical services team, really as well as all of our planning staff, to take their data and their products and share them in a way that is publicly digestible. We also frequently provide data and information to the news media, to our members, as well as members of the public themselves. Uh, to provide a snapshot of some of our educational um, events and materials, uh, really the first is Compass 101, what we're doing right now. Uh, we also, just as a side note, can take the show on the road, so to speak. We're always happy to present on Compass itself, like we're doing today, or on any of our specific uh, products or programs um, to anyone that you would like. If you would like to schedule us for a work, presentation or a service club or community event or a chamber of commerce, um, you can just reach out to me and I can connect you with the best speaker for your needs and your group. Another of our, edu our educational programs is our education series where we bring in regional and national experts to present and teach workshops on a wide variety of topics. Our most recent installment on electric vehicle infrastructure was just last week. Um, in case you missed it, we do have a recording of it on Compass's YouTube channel, and the slides from the presentation are available on Compass's website. Later this spring, we're planning for presentations on developing safety action plans, public-private partnerships, and universal design. So watch for information on those as they are scheduled on our website, and as they get close, we will also be sending out information via email and social media. In addition, we also have a wide variety of printed materials, such as brochures, displays, posters, and more, most of which are also available electronically. Nearly um, everything that we have discussed today can be found on Compass's website. Uh, those mini maps that all the different planners talked about, our plans and our products. Um, we are in the process of redesigning that website, so definitely be watching for a fresh new look from us later this spring. We also have a presence on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So if you are active on social media, I encourage you to follow us to stay abreast of um, what we're up to. We also frequently share information from our members so you really get a broad brush of what's going on in the Valley. In addition, we're always available for questions of any kind. If we don't know the answer, we can most likely direct you to who does. 
We use our education and outreach programs to set the stage for public engagement with our plans and planning products and other programs. The work we do really affects the quality of life of everyone who lives or works in Aden Canyon counties. Everyone's input is really integral to the planning and decision-making process. Public participation in that process can take on many different forms, depending on the type of project we're working on and where we are in the planning process. For example, public participation early in a project may take the form of focus groups or a survey on needs, while participation near the end of a project may ask people to review a draft plan or program or budget and provide their comments. We also hold open houses, give presentations, and provide other means of sharing information so that people really have a good sense of what it is that we are asking for their input on. We involve the public in many of the plans and projects that you've heard about today, really just about all the plans and projects you've heard about today. For example, we request public feedback on the draft TIP, Transportation Improvement Program, that Tony talked about every summer. In addition, we request comment on proposed changes to the TIP year-round. We also solicit feedback and input into the Long Range Transportation Plan, Communities in Motion. As Lisa mentioned, we've had three large surveys to inform what goes into that plan, as well as three focus groups early in the planning process. Later this year, we'll be soliciting um, public comment on the draft of that plan, and that'll occur this fall. In the nearer term, later this spring, we'll be requesting your public comment on an updated coordinated public transit human services transportation plan, which focuses on transportation needs of individuals with disabilities, older adults, and people with low incomes. The survey results and all the comments we receive are used by Compass staff to help shape our plans, programs, and recommendations to the Board of Directors. And they're also provided to the Board of Directors for their consideration in the decision-making process. Also, anyone is welcome to send us thoughts and comments at any time, even if there's not a formal survey or public comment period open. Our Leadership in Motion Awards highlight successes and collaboration. These are awarded to projects, businesses, and individuals each December for work done in support of the goals and vision of Communities in Motion. Award nominations open each August. It's never too early to start thinking about who be, may be deserving of your nomination. Ultimately, all of our programs support regional collaboration from board meetings and other formal facilitated meetings to informal discussions with members of the public to everything in between. So how can you be in the know? How can you know what's going on so that you can be involved? First, I suggest you subscribe to our email list. By the nature of being here today, there's a really good chance you already are on there. But if you're not, or if you're unsure, uh, you can message me in the chat or send me an email or click on the link on our homepage to subscribe. We also promote all of our public comment materials, all of our speakers and more through that email list. Second, as I mentioned earlier, if you're active on social media, I really encourage you to follow us. We promote all of our educational opportunities, other opportunities to be involved, as well as just share information and information related to Compass, our mission and our, our members. We also have a Keeping Up With Compass newsletter. Everyone who is on a Compass work group or committee or on the Compass Board of Directors, which combined is most of you, uh, receives this newsletter each month. It comes from me as an email. The purpose of the newsletter is to keep you apprised of what the other committees and work groups are, do are doing and what the Board of Directors is doing to see projects and decisions as they work their way through Compass's process. If you are not on a work group or committee but would like to receive the newsletter, let me know and I will add you to the list. The newsletter is also available on the Compass website, so you can access it at any time. Finally, if you're more of a don't call me, I'll call you kind of a person, I encourage you just to check out the website periodically. As I mentioned, pretty much we talked about today can be found there, plus much more. Things that are happening in the near term or are um, important at that time can be found under the hot topics or find it fast on the homepage. Finally, just one additional note um, to tag on what Matt mentioned earlier. Um, one of the ways that we support our members is by offering meeting facilitation and keypad polling services to assist with their public meetings, your public meetings. So if you are in need of either of those types of services, simply let me know and we can discuss your needs in more detail and find a plan forward for you. So in our rapidly growing region, collaboration is really key to planning for a future that reflects all the things that makes the Treasure Valley so attractive in the first place. 
Before we switch gears, so to speak, to take a deep dive into demographics with Carl, I'll again open the floor to questions you may have. I don't see any additional questions raised in the chat, uh, but I will um, open the floor if anyone would like to unmute themselves and ask any questions orally. Thanks. And I am looking at microphones. I do not see anyone that has unmuted themselves. If you do have a question, please speak up. I don't see any. We have an extremely quiet group today. You guys may set the record of the fewest uh, questions we have ever received. Uh, but with that, I will turn you over to Carl Miller to talk about demographic data and Compass's role in demographics in the region. Thank you. Great. Uh, good morning. Um, great to have you. Amy, could you just confirm that you're also seeing the correct screen? Yes, I am. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Um, Fortunately, I'm not. So hold on just a second, make sure I'm all set up here. Okay. Um, okay, so great. I'd like to, my, well, first of all, my name is Carl Miller. I'm part of Lisa's planning team, and I'm gonna give a deep dive to demographics today. I'd like to start with a quote by Jim Stengel, the former global marketing officer of Procter & Gamble. He says, if you wanna understand how a lion hunts, don't go to the zoo, go to the jungle. Um, and to me, this means that to really to understand how to plan land use, housing, and transportation, it's critical that we have really accurate demographic data, such as births, deaths, and migrations, that highlight the changing nature of how people live and work and their travel needs, both now as well as into the future. Um, so today I'm going to cover uh, why does Compass do demographics? What do some of our current demographics look like? How do we determine future demographics? And then I'll talk about some tools that may help you in your efforts. Um, so first, why demographics? Um, well, demographics are really the first and key step to almost any planning effort. To understand a population, uh, well, to serve a population, you need to understand that population. So let's say you live in a city of about 100,000 people. Um, that can mean really different things. The villages Florida and Orem, Utah are about that size. Uh, but the median age in the villages is 70 years old, while Orem, Utah, it's about 26 years old. So obviously schools, businesses, and the transportation needs of the people will vary greatly based on these demographic differences. So let's talk about how we gather our current demographic data. Um, and first distinguish between what we call our estimates and our forecast. Our current demographics have to do with the existing information about where we are at today. This is our population, our housing, our jobs, and we update this information typically on an annual basis. And we use this for a variety of different things, but we use these for Compass member dues, uh, grants, economic development, and share these with the private sector so they can also plan for future needs. Um, and our future demographics or forecasts are where we'll be in the future. Again, population, housing, and jobs. But we typically update these on a four-year cycle to coincide with our uh, long-range transportation plan. But we also reconcile these on an annual basis to make sure that they're as accurate and, and up-to-date as possible. And our forecasts really serve as the foundation for our transportation analysis that we do with Marianne's travel demand model, as well as a lot of different analysis, both that we do at Compass as well as our member agencies. So uh, the most exciting current demographic uh, news is that uh, the uh, census data has finally come out and we have results from that. Uh, that's a once every decade opportunity to get complete data from every person in the region rather than just surveyed data. And prior to the census, Compass worked with many different stakeholder groups to work on both the technical side as well as the outreach aspects of the 2020 census preparation. Uh, this picture was a bus billboard that Compass used for some of the outreach campaign. So let's address the big question. Was the 2020 census accurate? Well, there's four main concerns to the accuracy of the census. First, it was the first um, digital uh, census where the primary and the census's preferred method of collecting household information was through uh, the internet. Uh, and this obviously caused problems with both technical issues, cybersecurity risks, as well as disinformation campaigns that made it uh, difficult for people to participate. Uh, secondly, there was a, at one time a citizenship question, which was considered for the 2020 census. Ultimately, that question was not used, but the consideration of it made many groups unwilling or uncomfortable with, with participating in the census. 
Uh, third, we always have some hard to count populations. Uh, and this uh, census, those uh, we had even lower than expected levels of participation from the public in the, in the final months. Um, with a, the new reality that people just don't want to open up their doors to a stranger during the middle of a pandemic. And then obviously we had COVID and other <clears throat> issues that led to uh, challenges and difficulties getting a full count. Um, because of COVID, uh, many university students returned home, uh, so making it harder for them to be counted in the place where they go to school. Uh, and oftentimes there was a, a, a misunderstanding about where they should be counted and tallied. And then not only COVID, but we also had wildfires, coastal hurricanes, and a lot of these things upended the Census Bureau's work at just as the time that the door knockers were coming out to survey uh, the, the remaining people that had not participated. So I think we're all can say that we're happy to be gl uh, glad to be done with the last two years um, and on, on to other things. So ultimately, was the census accurate? Well, I think it's a difficult question because this is really our only chance once in a decade to count every person. Um, but the Census Bureau has done analysis and have found that their, their counts uh, fall between the low and middle estimates um, that they were expecting. So it is plausible that these, these numbers are uh, correct. And then the Census Bureau will be doing a final report this spring, which will measure the uh, accuracy of the census um, and then be sharing that with us. So we're looking forward to that information. So with that cave caveat, what did we actually learn from the 2020 census? So let me cover four main th things. First, apportionment. Second, growth. A third, our urban-rural shift. And fourth, diversity. So um, the Census Bureau is done so that we can, we can use uh, the, the counts to reapportion seats in the U.S. House of Representatives to make sure that uh, as close to possible, each person gets, uh, each one person gets one vote. Um, so six states gained a seat. Um, that would be Colorado, Florida, Montana, North Carolina, and Oregon. Texas actually got two seats. Um, Idaho just missed a third seat by about 27,000 people. Um, but I think we're in strong position for another seat in 2030. Um, but it could be worse. New York lost one seat after falling short by just 89 people. Um, and they were one of seven states that lost a seat, including California, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Um, but not only nationally, but also at the local scale, redistricting matters because state and local officials will use these results to draw congressional, state, and local district boundaries. Uh, second, the amount of urban change. Um, Metropolitan areas grew by, over, by about 9% over the last decade compared to about a 1% decrease for, for rural areas. Uh, and so Compass is watching that as well as how is COVID regulations and working from home, home changes, how will that um, shift the balance over the next decade? But over the last 10 years, the Treasure Valley was the fastest growing metropolitan area for those metropolitan areas under 1 million people. And as this chart shows, Idaho is making rapid gains in the amount of urban population. And now 70% of the state is in an urban area. 83% uh, of the new population is in just one of these six counties. That includes Ada and Canyon, where we're at, Kootenai County, where Coeur d'Alene is, uh, Bonneville, Idaho Falls, uh, Madison County, where Rexburg is, and Twin Falls that Matt talked about previously. And over half of all statewide growth came from the Treasure Valley alone. Um, finally, uh, both the Treasure Valley and the state of Idaho and the nation had a larger increase of non-white population than white population. And that amount of ethnic minorities increased from 12% back in 2010 to about 20% uh, in the last census. Uh, so before I move on from the 2020 census, I wanted to quickly highlight some of the few, the next step the Census Bureau was going to take. First, they will be doing that post-enumeration survey that I talked about to estimate the accuracy of the 2020 counts. And then, as Matt talked about, we will get the official urbanized area boundaries this summer, which may affect which areas are necessi necessitate having MPOs to get that, fed that federal funding. Uh, third, a lot of the funding programs we see from the federal government will now be based on these new population counts. Um, and last, we'll use these new base uh, counts for our interdecennial uh, population estimates. So let me talk a little bit more about our population estimates. Um, we do this to take an even more granular look to see how the community is growing and to make sure that we're uh, keeping up with this growth, that we uh, know which areas are um, 
are, are growing and how to serve this population. So five factors go into our population estimates. We have our, like I talked about, our baseline of the decennial census households. We add to that every year with new residential units permitted. And then we factor in a, a typical household size and a typical occupancy rate based on the, the type and location of that new residential unit that was built. And then we update our group quarters populations. And group quarters would be things where people live together in one uh, housing structure, but are not necessarily related. So dormitories, prisons, jails, um, and, and the like. So um, let me go into uh, a couple of those. First of all, uh, we work closely with your building departments to track new growth. Annually, we produce this report, um, a report called the Demographic Monitoring Report, which evaluates construction trends year to year that dates back all the way to 2000. And in fact, we have data for Ada County that goes back all the way to 1980. Uh, this is what I call our mountain range chart because it shows the amount of new residential units per year and where we've had peaks and valleys as far as new construction. Um, for our population estimates, we use this new residential units uh, to build on the decennial counts. And then we uh, factor in, like I said, vacancy rates and household sizes, and then just the group quarters to come up with a, a year by year population estimates for each of our communities. So where is everybody coming from? Well, this map shows the most in migration between 2015 and 2019 has been from larger West Coast and also from Intermountain West communities. The light blue dots represent metro migration, in migration from other, um, from other states. And then the dark blue dots show migration from other Idaho metropolitan areas. Uh, and you can see in our top 10, uh, we have uh, migration from Pocatello at fifth, Twin Falls at sixth, and Idaho Falls at seventh. Uh, and then finally, we work with the Department of Labor to receive employment data. And this helps us with where our business is located at, number of employment uh, employees for each business, and the type of business that help feed into our travel demand model. Um, and while most of the census and demographic data that I'll talk about today, we're happy to share with you. Uh, unfortunately, we are obligated by the Department of Labor to keep this data confidential. Uh, the map that you see in front of you shows the uh, location of the employment and population centers for the Treasure Valley and how that's shifted to the west over the last few years. This data, since we have rolled it up to a regional scale, um, it, it, we are able to share this with you, but uh, typically we're not able to uh, provide that raw information uh, to, for you for your, for your purposes. Um, so having an understanding of our current demographics is critical to serving our existing population, but knowing our future demands also help us anticipate what are the, those needs into the future. Um, so first of all, I just wanna let you know that we do not have a magic eight ball that tells us the future, but we do have something better. We have a dog. Uh, well, not that dog. We have a demographic advisory work group, a dog comprised of local planners, developers, and others that have their hand on the pulse of the market. And they provide us various roles, including reviewing those population and employment estimates, uh, providing guidance to our forecast that we create. They provided a lot of the technical uh, preparation for the census 2020 and other tasks as they come out throughout the year. Um, as far as forecasting, we have three main phases to our demographic forecast. First, developing that regional control total. Second, allocating that new growth to the different communities. And then third, updating or what we call reconciling that growth to make sure it's as up-to-date and accurate as possible. So let me break down each of those three steps for you. First, developing that regional forecast to really answer the question, how many people will live and work in the Treasure Valley in the future? Um, so there's a lot of different ways to come up with that demographic forecast. Each has inherent advantages and disadvantages. And our demographic advisory work group, our DOG, looked at over a dozen methods and selected these five uh, to consider in our forecast. The cohort component method, which is based on current demographic comp composition of the region, so age, gender, um, and, and birth rates. Our econometric method, which then looks at the employment composition of the region. A peer or analogous area where we look at similar regions that maybe were about the same size as the Treasure Valley 20 to 30 years ago, and evaluating what caused them to grow um, over the last few decades. A top-down or a ratio method which considers a statewide or even a larger area and considers how much of that new growth will be local. And then trends, looking at the past to anticipate the future. Can we expect the same amount of growth that we've had in the past? 
Uh, putting all these things together, you can see that we have quite a range in what those that 2050 population could be. On the low end, we have that cohort component method, which would be less than a million people by then. And on the high end, we have the trend with almost 1.2 million people. Um, the, the demographic advisory work group recommended looking at these and averaging out these five methods to come up with a uh, population forecast of 1,075,000 people by 2050. So I know you're asking yourself, is any of this accurate? Well, anybody that's had a job interview five years ago and got that dreaded question about where do you see yourself in five years? Well, nobody would have guessed what we saw in 2020. So let me just say that first of all, making predictions about the future is really difficult. Um, despite that, our population forecast back that we made in 2004 predicted a, a population of 730,000 people by 2020. The actual census count, 726,072. That is only a half percent difference. And since 2004, we've ranged from about two to 7% net difference between the actual totals, uh, depending just on the horizon year and which forecast we were making. Um, so if you're looking at the two bar charts and you can't even tell the difference in size, that should tell you just how close that forecast was. As Lisa mentioned, our Communities of Motion 2050 plan has been developed with heavy public and stakeholder participation. Um, and what we learned from those public surveys really influenced that growth allocation, that second step. Well, we started with the explore phase, uh, getting feedback from the public about demographic, technological, and societal changes that would impact the future um, growth of the Valley. In the second phase, we did our where do we grow from here survey, and we learned that people wanted an efficient land use pattern where growth was well managed. And then in our third survey, we got feedback from that locally favored high capacity transit option to parallel I-84 in that uh, successful all aboard survey. So all of these surveys uh, generated a huge amount of public comments and all told we had over 18,000 participants between the three surveys. Uh, this was uh, used uh, heavily to develop that, um, the forecast for our demographic allocation for our growth. And the result of this, um, we're calling the Communities in Motion 2050 vision map. Uh, the vision establishes that demographic data and that we use and feeds into our travel demand analysis and really all other transportation analysis. And while this map is not a prescriptive map telling you exactly how growth has to occur, uh, the benefits of following the vision include preserving farmland, reducing infrastructure costs, and providing better access to a variety of transportation options. So then the third step that we take is to keep a constant eye on that forecast and align that with how new development um, is, is being um, created in the Valley. On an annual basis, we compare our new subdivisions and proposals and we adjust that forecast as necessary. So for example, a few years ago, we, we knew that there would be some employment um, and we forecasted that growth in the Nampa Gateway area. However, we didn't expect it to be so quick and robust as when Amazon announced a new warehouse for the area. So we updated our, our forecast to account for this new development and really make sure that our forecasts are accurate and up-to-date as possible. So let me conclude with a little bit more about the various demographic tools that Compass has and is willing to share with our member agencies. First, demographic data on our development checklist, and then our newest tool, the fiscal impact tool. So as we discussed, we have a lot of great demographic data at our fingertips, especially right after the decennial census. This ranges from the migration, migration data uh, that we uh, showed you earlier that seems to get a lot of attention nowadays, the building permit data that we put into our demographic uh, development monitoring report, and that has a, a lot of history there, and then other data that we either collect or we produce. We also provide local performance data to support your local planning efforts. Our development checklist uh, helps bridge the gap between the regional goals that we've all set and those local decisions that you need to make. Uh, providing uh, useful information about how proposed developments can move the needle towards our performance. Um, it really helps us to, to work together towards a unified vision for growth. Um, and then finally, our fiscal impact tool can help with a lot of um, planning analysis, including uh, helping to determine what's the cost of growth. Um, what are the new services that will be required when new uh, subdivisions or uh, development proposals are made? What are the revenues expected from that growth? Do the revenues exceed the costs? Um, how does location impact that cost and revenue balance? And basically answer the question, is growth paying for itself? 
Uh, this can be a useful tool for either evaluating specific development proposals that come your way, or even taking a larger look at the impact of a comprehensive plan, land use plan, or sub area plan. So I don't think I have the time to tell you about all the demographic tools that we have. Uh, however, let me just say, if you have any demographic questions, please call us first. Um, so let me take a moment as a concluding speaker to emphasize that Compass is an association of local governments. We facilitate regional cooperation. We serve as regional technical resource. We assist member agencies in securing resources to meet those local needs um, and regional needs. And that we identify regional needs through our long range uh, uh, planning efforts with our long range transportation plan that you'll see later this year called Communities Motion 2050. Um, so with that, Amy, do you have any questions for me or for any of our speakers before we wrap up? Thank you, Carl. Um, before I dive into questions, um, just a reminder to everyone, you will receive a follow-up email from me after this presentation with an evaluation of today's presentation, or excuse me, an evaluation form of today's presentation. Uh, we really hope you will complete that and return it to us. It does help us improve. Um, that email will also contain a link to today's slides as well, or an attachment of today's slides, um, some other attachments, as well as some other links to items that we discussed today on the Compass website. So definitely be watching for that. Um, a couple of questions that are posed to me in the chat. Um, first, Carl, you talked about the in-migration data, where people are coming from. Do you have any information on where people that are leaving the Treasure Valley are going to? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, we often don't talk about that part of it as much. Um, uh, as we've seen so much in migration, but out migration is also a lot of those same locations, but also to smaller communities in, in Idaho. So um, I think there's a, a mix, either people going to uh, other large cities, maybe for employment, and as well as people leaving for smaller communities in Idaho um, that uh, maybe uh, have, have uh, seen how much the area has grown and, and want a smaller community. Great, thank you. And then one other question that was posed to me in the chat you talked about, at the very end, the fiscal impact. Um, and Marian talked about the, the cost benefit. Are those the same thing? Uh, no, they're, they're really different. I'll let Marian talk about the cost benefit. But the fiscal impact really looks at the public sector costs of, uh, and revenues of new growth. So as a new, maybe a subdivision comes in, depending on the location and the type of, of housing and, and house, land use mix, it, uh, the, that tool will look at what is the expected revenues from property taxes and impact fees, as well as the cost of providing schools, roads, um, emergency services, and help to evaluate, uh, is that a, a positive or neg negative fiscal impact return? Marianne, do you want to talk about cost benefit? Sure. So on the cost benefit side, it really uh, looks more at transportation investment and basically what's your return on investment. And so it'll look at the, the cost of a project, the full cost of a project, but then also value how it maybe uh, saves us travel time or uh, congested uh, conditions and goes through a full process of, of evaluating that. And it has in it typically is best to look at it for more of a long term. What if we did the project? What if we didn't do the project? And it's really based on those those differences or those deltas. Great. Thank you, Marianne. And Marianne, why don't you stay up because I have another question for you. Um, how has the remote workforce changed traffic volumes? Is this forecast to be a long term change or employers indicating a timeline that would bring people back to the office? Right. We're seeing a little bit of a mix. So Absolutely. We compared 2019 and then looked at every month going into 2020 before we went into the first stay in place uh, order and issued by the governor. And then when we started to see some, some recovery, and we have about 75 locations in the two county area, and we have uh, Idaho Transportation Department has permanent traffic counters. So we have this wealth of information to watch what's going on. We are seeing many areas already ex matching or exceeding the 2019 volume, but we've had a lot of growth too. The areas that are still uh, slower to recover, if, if you want to use that term, are some of those areas going in, into the, the downtown Boise area just because it's such a larger concentration of office type type jobs. So I did mention the household travel survey and that was 
kind of a risk. We actually delayed it because of COVID because we wanted to see if the dust would settle or we would all settle back into some, some sort of pattern. So we collected that data last fall. So it was basically over September and October. And we specifically started to ask those questions. Do you work at home or do you have some sort of a hybrid? So yet to be seen on, is this a long-term shift or people shifting because they want to be back in the office and actually want to see people (laughs) face to face, or are we starting to see some more of those hybrids? So, uh, still to be determined, we'll have some reports and high level summaries coming out, uh, Thank you, Marianne. Um, I'll also ask Matt and Tony and Lisa to go ahead and turn your cameras back on. And then um, a follow-up question, is growth in the Treasure Valley accelerating because of the ability to work from anywhere? That's maybe a maybe a Carl question. Yeah, that's a good question. And I say it's still a little bit TBD. I mean, we're pretty early on as far as how, um, especially from this, this significant shift from COVID has affected work from home. So um, as you look at maybe some of those places that in places that are migrating to the Treasure Valley, they're typically from more expensive um, West Coast cities where you can, at least for time being, uh, housing affordability is a little bit um, better here. So that would lend itself to, um, there may be some increase in, in migration because of that. But um, as housing prices are accelerating and uh, the, like Marianne said, the dust still needs to settle on uh, how is the work from home going to shake out? Um, still a little bit hard to say at this point, but we're seeing some signs. Great. Thank you, Carl. That is the last question I have in the chat. Um, final opportunity, if anyone would like to unmute yourself and ask a question um, to any of us on anything we discussed today or anything you were hoping to hear us discuss today, um, but we did not touch on. And I am just checking microphones. I don't see anyone that has unmuted themselves additionally. So again, I would like to thank you all for coming today. You guys have been a very quiet group. We got done Um, very early with very few questions, but I appreciate everyone's attention today and and your attendance. As I said, watch for an email from me with some links and some attachments with additional information uh, from today's presentation. That email will also include an evaluation form that we ask you to complete and send back to me so that we can improve um, our Compass 101 presentation for next year. If you have questions after the fact that you think later, I wish I would have asked that, Um, send those to me via email as well, and either I can address them or I can forward it on to the appropriate staff person in Memphis, and we can reach back out to you and get your questions or your needs addressed. But with that, I will um, say thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you to um, all of my colleagues at Compass for your presentations this morning, and I wish everyone a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks.